Thank you, Tom, for a wonderful dinner and a kind introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the uh, opportunity to speak here in London. I'd like to uh, begin this session by pointing out to you, many of you don't need it pointed out to you, but it's always polite to do so, that putting on a conference is one of the hardest tasks in the world. Uh, dealing with prima donna speakers like Tom and I, uh, putting a nice venue together, making sure that the coffee's hot, uh, assembling the intellectual capital, it's really, truly like herding cats. And so what I'd like to do at the beginning of this is get the entire audience to jo join me in a round of applause for Mining Journal and the Aspermont employees who put on this fine show. I, I do that, really, uh, so that I make sure as an early morning speaker I get an applause line somewhere through my talk. So thank you again. You've been tricked. I have an impossibly broad topic this morning. I don't know who assigned it to me, uh, probably myself in a moment when I wasn't thinking. And so what I think I'm going to do, rather than attempt to describe uh, the market impacting all investors' decisions, is I'm gonna talk to you about the investor that I know the best, who is me. Uh, and I'm going to describe the market conditions really as best I can and talk about risk in this market in particular as best I can. I have two particular points that are of interest to me that I think are also of use to you. The first, of course, concerning investment decisions and market risk. We hear a lot about risk in the mining business because we're exposed to it so often. Uh, reserve risk, financial risk, exploration risk, political risk. I'm both delighted and saddened to say that in 40 years in the industry, I've actually learned to locate precisely the most dangerous risk, at least as it affects my own portfolio. And that risk is conveniently located immediately to the left of my right ear and to the right of my left ear. It turns out, as an investor, uh, even given the pernicious nature, pernicious nature, pardon me, of the taxing authorities and regulators and things like that, all of my worst outcomes, all of my worst injuries have been self-inflicted. And I hope in the context of this discussion about the risks and the reward ahead of us in mining, what you come away with is the fact that all of the broad factors in the world are sort of given to you. They're cards that are dealt. There's nothing you can do about any of them. It's the way that you react to them that is important. That's what I've learned over time. It's really, really, really fun, uh, convenient, in fact, to blame other people for your mistakes. I've had plenty of opportunity to do that over the years. Uh, and what I've learned is, in fact, that I am primarily responsible for my mistakes. So take the remarks that I'm going to make in that context and try and observe it yourself. The second point that I was going to make and stress, uh, Tom wisely took from me. Uh, when you look across the broad commodity markets or any markets, it's too easy to focus on things that don't matter much. Uh, and sometimes the truth, while they're important, are so evident that you discount them. Uh, in fact, very often when investors, as an example, look at companies and you ask them, as an example, what the company's worth, they'll quote the market capitalization. And what you learn over time is that that's the price, which is often very, very, very different from the value. What we do as investors too often is we focus on the obvious, easy to obtain information and we forget about the relevant information. And Tom wisely pointed out that irrespective of every other aspect of the commodities business, the single most important aspect of the commodities business is the longest unbroken bull market in history, which is the ascent of man. The bottom of the demographic pyramid, which Tom described as two billion people, is about a quarter of what you need to know. I was in Zimbabwe last week. I've been many times over the years. And I've watched a country, despite the best efforts of its leadership, to wreck it. 
that's a f fantastic place. And as Tom pointed out, the bottom of the demographic pyramid wants to live like you and I live. And in the last 30 years, they have slowly, haltingly, begun to get the ability to compete with you and I for the stuff of life. It's important to consider the bottom of the demographic pyramid too because of the difference in the utility desired by various consumers. Stuff. All of us, some of you would object to this, but all of us have too much stuff. All of us could probably improve our lives by taking 25% of our possessions and consigning them to a solid waste facility. If we get more money, what do we spend? We buy some little thing that I can't pronounce from Apple, uh, and, and then we spend $1,000 on some form of distracting data. This is not the stuff of a resource bull market. When poor people, however, very poor people, get more money, they take their calorie intake from 1,500 to 2,200. As Tom says, people who used to walk get a bicycle. People who had a bicycle get a 75cc motorcycle. People who had a 75cc motorcycle get a Toyota Hilux. People with a thatch roof get a metal roof. It is the ascent of man. It's the ascent of the living standards of the bottom one quarter of the population that continues to drive the natural resource business. The best paraphrase of this goes back, what, 30, 32 years, I'm thinking. Dong Chaoping uh, said, it doesn't matter if the cat is red, it doesn't matter if the cat is white, what matters is that the cat catches mice. In other words, a system that provides wealth for the people is the best system. Then he said, something I like better, to be rich is glorious. I strive for glory like many of you. And that statement, I think, paraphrases what has happened in the last 30 years. And that statement is, I think, the single most important facet in the mining business and the way that you must take all other data. The second thing that you must remember, and this is obvious except for people don't pay attention to it. This is an extraordinarily capital intensive, capital in, uh, cyclical business. And the consequence of that, the consequence of the fact that the highs end up being higher and the lows end up being higher, itself is a consequence of the, event, uh, of the uh, ascent of man, means that as an investor, you either will be a contrarian or you are going to be a victim. The nature of the business is that at market bottoms, when things are very, very, very cheap, we have been punished in our investments. And at the same point in time when the goods are on sale, we're afraid to buy them. Conversely, interestingly, when the prices have escalated 200% or 300%, when operating margins are in the mining business are at 35 or 40 or 50%, when the prices don't need to go any higher, we assume it's a good business. It's odd, really odd, if the group of us here were down on Regent Street or some fancy shopping district in London, and there was a shop on this side that said, all goods on sale, 75% off, no reasonable or unreasonable offer, refused. And a sign over here said, bespoke merchants, no <laughs> discounts, everything frighteningly expensive. Where would you go? A bear market is a sale. That's all it is. And our refusal to buy goods on sale and our assistance, insistence, pardon me, as investors, as an industry, as consumers, to pay too much is one of the odd paradoxes of the equity market. Think about another business. Think about if you were buying, as an example, a suit jacket, not one like mine because I wear cheap suits, but somebody who dressed well. Would you pr prefer? to pay $500 for a jacket, or would you prefer to pay $2,000 for a jacket? It seems, as mining share investors, that commonly we prefer $2,000 to $500. And that's why I say, in the whole panoply of risk that confronts us, the most outrageous and egregious risk is the one that's to the left of our right ear and to the right of my left ear. And so what I try and do is avoid the really obvious risks. So let's talk about the current market with that sort of framework. 
Uh, we've talked about the most important part of the market, which I see as the ascent of man. I, and I'm not an economist, I have to tell you. Many of you know I'm a, a credit analyst, which is a very polite word for a corporate pawnbroker. But I, I, I can't get past the fact that we've been in about eight years of fairly stable, if shallow, economic growth. Not being economist, an economist, I don't know how long recoveries are supposed to last. I have a halting fear that this one's long of tooth. I'm a natural bull in extractive industries, and I particularly like the pervasive gloom in the mining industry. It's usually been a good sign. The one thing that bothers me at the beginning of this discussion is I wonder what would happen if this synchronous global recovery began to shorten up. That's a problem because all of the other bullish factors I'm going to talk about on the supply side could be offset by a decline in demand. Another thing that I see in the broad sector in the markets that scares me, uh, and I'm not saying it's fatal, I, I'm just saying it scares me, is I believe that there's extraordinary excess liquidity in the economy. I think there's too much cash. And one of the nervousnesses I have, I don't want to speak to Great Britain or the EU because I'm not as familiar with your markets as I am my own. But in the United States, I have a fear, and hopefully Tom can disabuse me of it today, I have a fear that we're using liquidity as a substitute for solvency. When I look at the strength of the US dollar, the only explanation I can give you is that the competing stores of value must be absolutely abysmal. Don't get the sense that I'm anti-American. I live there, there's a lot about the country that's fantastic. But when I look at 20, personally, when I look at 20 trillion dollars in on balance sheet liabilities, think about 20 trillion by the way, write it down right now. I'll make it easy for you, that's 20 with 12 zeros. This is a boatload of goddamn zeros. 20 trillion in on-balance li sheet liabilities and off-balance sheet liabilities. Anybody here know what an off-balance sheet liability is? No takers? Me. I'm 65. I got a Medicare card. If you're American, young American, I don't know if you're American or not, but if you're a young person, uh, we've done a transfer of liability. I made myself a bunch of promises and you all have to keep them. Uh, it's an interesting circumstance. Off-balance sheet liabilities are $120 trillion. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm just saying that I have a nervousness in, in my country in particular that liquidity has come to be viewed as a substitute for solvency. Uh, another problem that I see is um, the increase in populism and nationalism, not only resource nationalism, trade wars, a circumstance where you, quote, make trade fair, makes everyone poorer. That's the nature of things. It makes everyone poorer. And at the same time that we would decry resource nationalism uh, in various countries where we exist, we have to look at our own behavior as voters. You know, a fair, a fair trade agreement, Tom and I could do a fair trade agreement right now. We could get one piece of paper and say, there shall be no regulatory restrictions on the free movement of goods and services between two willing adults. End. When you have a trade agreement that runs 3,600 pages, there's nothing free about that trade that we need to consider. In mining, of course, we need to remember too, which we always forget, that markets work. The cure for high prices is not the legislature. The cure for high prices is high prices. High prices constrain demand and they increase supply. The cure for low prices is low prices too. Uh, one of the things that always amuses me in the commodities business is how we all ignore the self-fulfilling prophecies. I remember two years ago addressing an audience here in London. There was a lot of skepticism about the oil price. It had fallen from, I don't know what it was, $140 to $40. And pretty intelligent publications, uh, what's the, uh, the Economist, was talking about $10 oil. So there was a lot of gloom in the audience about the oil price. And I, mercifully, as a consequence of being old and having been through this cycle before, I was able to say to the audience, well, you know, the International Ag Energy Agency says the fully loaded cost to produce a barrel of oil, 
This includes prior year write-downs, not the kind of accounting we do in the resource business, but accounting for money that got sent to Money Heaven too, is about 60 US dollars a barrel. So right now on a global basis, we make, uh, we make oil for $60 and we sell it for 45. We lose $15 a barrel 100 million times a day. In other words, the industry on average is losing a billion and a half dollars a day. They're gonna get bored of this over some period of time. And if you decide, what you need to decide as to whether the oil price is gonna go up is really simple. Five years from now, six years from now, when you go to your garage, turn the key to the right, will the car start? If you think the car will start, then you believe that the oil price is gonna go back to 60 or $65. And you can repeat this exercise across all the basic commodity functions. When the price of copper is $2 a pound and the incentive price for Tom to produce a pound of copper is $3.50, well, if you're losing $1.50 a pound in the copper business, you don't open new mines. That's what's happening. And if you don't open new mines, when you come back to this conference five years from now and you hit the switch in the back of the room, the lights don't go on. If you think the lights are gonna go on, you think there's $3.50 copper. And that is the way the resource business works. It's really simple. I encounter all kinds of gloom now in the uranium business because the uranium price is $25 a pound. Same agency, International Energy Agency, says the incentive price for new uranium production, $55 a pound. People hate uranium, but people like the lights to go on. Uranium is 15% of US baseload demand. If you wonder whether the uranium price will get back above $55 a pound, you need to ask yourself whether in five years or six years the lights will go on in the United States. My vote is yes, which is a different way of saying that I believe that the uranium price, as an example, goes back to $55 a pound. This isn't a suggestion, by the way, that you buy uranium stocks. It's only a suggestion that you remember when you invest that markets work, that you pay attention to big things. The third thing, I guess, that I'm seeing in the broad markets that really interests me is the fact that even in an industry that has been as conservative and resistant to change and resistant to technology, resistant to innovation as mining, that innovation is beginning to work in mining. A bunch of different kinds of innovation are working in mining. Nobody could accuse me of being politically correct. But one of the things I enjoy seeing in mining that I have never seen in my entire life are young women working in mining. I'm not excited about this because I think diversity is in and of itself linked to profitability, except that you must be nice to the legislatures. What I like is the fact that the mining industry is all of a sudden opening itself up to 50% of the intellectual capital of mankind that it has refused to access for years and years and years. I was in Congo not too long ago visiting the uh, Ivanhoe deposits and what I found there was something I never would have seen in Africa myself 25 years ago. I found that the senior technologists working for Ivanhoe were Congolese. And they weren't Congolese because it was politically correct to hire Congolese in the Congo. These were superb human beings. You would use these people in Peru, you would use these people in Nevada, you would use these people in British Columbia. This always existed, but the mining business was too conservative, too hardbound, and frankly looked too much like me, old, fat, white guys. The fact that the industry has decided to reflect the world that it operates in and access intellectual capital, irrespective of plumbing or skin color, I think is an amazing innovation, and I think it will pay tremendous dividends for us. And I don't mean social dividends. I think it'll pay tremendous dividends because we're accessing talents that uh, occur across mankind. Uh, I'm, I, I'm really excited about that. That's the good news. Now let's talk about the bad news just for fun in the mining business. Uh, it's an old speaker's trick. You make people happy to get them listen to you and then you get them sick, scared, so they listen to you better. And then by the end of the presentation, you try and make them happy again, just in case you're wondering what I'm trying to do to you. The mining business is interesting. I've been in it all my life. 
And I think I can say, without fear of contradictions, two really ugly things. The first is that in 40 years, the mining business in aggregate on balance has destroyed capital. If you look at all the money that went in and all the money that came out, the truth is it's a real trick to add a column of negative numbers and come up with a positive sum. And we haven't been able to do that. In the junior sector, which is where I've focused for 40 years, <laughs> the outcome is way worse. <laughs> it's way worse. I, I have fun with this when I address junior mining conferences and people talk about the fact that the industry is capital short. We've caused it to become capital short by losing all the money. If you merged every junior mining company in the world, some of you have heard this before, you get to hate me twice. If you merged every junior mining company in the world into one company, Junior Explore Co., in a very good year, a very good year, that business would lose $2 billion. In a bad year, which the industry thinks is good because they get lots of money, it loses $5 billion. So what do you think this industry's worth? Is it worth six times losses? Nine times losses? What's the correct price ro loss ratio for mineral exploration? It's an interesting thing to ponder. Yet, yet, the performance of a few companies in the sector is so outstanding that it adds legitimacy and occasionally luster to the entire sector. A real challenge given how much money the sector loses over time. So what I want to leave you with is when you invest in the industry, you're making a mistake. The beauty of this conference, I think, is that rather than focusing on the mining industry, it focused on 30 great projects. I don't care if you focus on projects. I don't care if you focus on managers. What you need to understand is that in the mining business, like every other business, in the first instance, your success is guaranteed over time by the ascent of man. In the second instance, your investment performance can increase by buying goods when they're on sale, in other words, in bear markets. In the third instance, and we'll talk about this more in just a minute on the panel, performance dispersal curves are not efficient. The best producers in the world generate 10 times or 20 times or 30 times as much wealth as the median or the mean. So concentrating on the best deposits, the best people in the worst markets is really what has been responsible for at least Sprott's success, and I suspect could be responsible for your success. One of the innovations that I think we need to consider, we talked about this yesterday, one of the innovations that we have to see in resources, and I promise I'll get done quickly and give you back the time, one of the innovations that I think we've seen in the resource business that's important is the emergence of the royalty businesses, the streaming businesses, and our own bespoke lending businesses. And this is a response to the fact that the industry has destroyed capital for 40 years. The investors have decided that they want to get paid first before the industry destroys all the money. And I think that's very rational. I think that the discipline that's being imposed on managers by revenue streams that are coming out of production in a declining business is a wholly positive sign. It returns money to investors and it disciplines the capital allocation process. As to the idea that this industry is capital short, yesterday we heard a presentation from a startup company, Cobalt 21, that raised $880 million. A competent, respected management team with a good idea, a startup raised $880 million, and yet we suggest we're undercapitalized. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope when you look out, you understand that the market that we're in is a very, very, very good market. People are feeling dismal. Some goods, even some goods from good people, are on sale. And sales are good. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Tom.